Thursday was the annual holiday concert at Sam's School. It's a December celebration with a 37-year pedigree. And it's been struggling for an identity over the last few years, ever since the school board decreed that the December pageant must acknowledge the cultural diversity of the school. <laughs> it's, it's a dictum that does not sit well with a number of parents. And changes to the concert have been debated passionately over the past few years. Efforts to find a middle ground to accommodate both the Christmas traditionalists and the Board of Education have met with varying degrees of success. Last year's solstice celebration made no mention of Christmas until the end of the show. <laughs> when the grade threes lined up on stage holding big cardboard letters that spelled out Merry Christmas. And then one by one, the kids stepped forward with their letters and they spelled their greeting out loud. M is for Muslim. E is for ecumenical. R is for reformed Jew. When they got through Mary and it was time for the C in Christmas, Naomi Cohen held up her green C and she sang out, C is for Hanukkah. <laughs> and then Moira Failing, who was standing beside her, held up her red H and she said, H is for Hanukkah too. The concert managed to offend so many parents on both sides of the issue <laughs> that a committee was struck to review the whole idea. It was Rita Slaymaker, the committee chair, who came to Morley last April and asked for help. Y you're in theater, she said, and we want to put on a musical, a holiday sort of musical, and we were, we were hoping that you would direct it. Morley began attending the Wednesday evening committee meetings last April. And when she came home from these meetings, it would take her two hours to wind down. They're, they're, they're all crazy, she'd say, as she paced back and forth. Uh, I'd rather chew tinfoil and go back next week. But before summer vacation, her impatience began to dissipate. We're, we're getting to the meat of it, she said one night in June. It's, it's down to the Wizard of Oz or Frosty the Snowman. Morley spent the summer rewriting Frosty the Snowman, essentially expanding the play so there'd be a part for all 248 children. <laughs> she, she added lots of street scenes. <laughs> and when she finished, there was a role for everyone, and including a cameo for the principal, Nancy Cassidy, who Morley coaxed into playing a talking pine tree. This is fun, she said to Dave one night as she collated scripts. She, she couldn't wait to get going, couldn't wait to start with the kids. The Saturday before the auditions were scheduled, parents began showing up at the house, offering help. <laughs> Catherine Gilcoin was first. I'm a seamstress, she said. I, I'm sure there'll be lots of sewing. I'd, I'd love to help with the costumes. Morley was delighted. They had coffee and they talked about the play, and then after an hour, when she was leaving, as if it was just an afterthought, Catherine reached into her purse and pulled out a brown manila envelope. This is Willie's resume, she said. <laughs> Willie, her son, in grade five. It was a 20-page resume, <laughs> including an 8 by 10 glossy. <laughs> Ruth Kelman arrived about an hour later, Right to the point, Ruth, I heard you weren't considering girls for the snowmen, she said. Her arms folded across her chest, her car in the driveway still running, her husband sitting glumly in the passenger seat, <laughs> their daughter Joanne in the back. As the rainy mornings of November folded into dark December afternoons, the play gradually took shape. Children were slowly settling into their roles. There were eventually four Frosties, two girls, two boys. <laughs> the story, as Morley had rewritten it, turned on a, on a flashback, a scene where Frosty recalled his days as a country snowman. And for the all-important farmyard scene, Morley had drafted Arthur, the family dog, and cast him as a sheep. 
Arthur, a docile and well-behaved dog by nature, did not adjust easily to the stage. The first few times Morley velcroed Arthur into his sheepskin. <laughs> he stood dolefully in the wings and refused to move staring balefully out from under his sheep ears with abject humiliation. <laughs> but, but as the weeks progressed, Arthur underwent a character change. He grinned whenever he saw his costume, <laughs> curling his lips back so you could see his teeth, <laughs> flattening his ears, narrowing his eyes. It was while he was dressed as a sheep that Arthur sniffed out and ate the contents of every lunch bag from Miss Young's grade four class. He had his sheep costume on when he devoured the huge gingerbread house that Sofia Del Vecchio had constructed and donated to the school. The closer they came to opening night, the more problems Morley uncovered. The afternoon they moved rehearsals into the auditorium, it became clear that there wasn't enough room for everyone on stage. The stage isn't big enough for the narrator, said Morley to Dave one afternoon on the phone after rehearsal. It was Dave's idea to erect scaffolding and put the narrator's chorus... <laughs> and put the narrator's chorus on what amounted to a balcony. Perfect, said Morley. Brilliant. Dee Dee Allen's father, who's in construction, said he could provide the scaffolding. Morley had thought one of the benefits of working on the play would be an opportunity to get to know some of the kids. Mostly, she got to know Mark Portner. Mark, who couldn't sit still. Mark, who spent one entire rehearsal pulling the window blinds up and down, <laughs> up and down. Mark, who tied Jane Capper's shoelaces together. Mark, who brought a goldfish from the science lab to a technical rehearsal and dropped it in Adrian White's apple juice. <laughs> On Thursday, the kids were sent home early with instructions to return at 6 o'clock with their costumes and props. They were to assemble in the double science lab where they'd be supervised by a group of parent volunteers. The kids were told they could bring quiet games to play while they waited for their cues. <laughs> Cards, books, stickers, no video games. At 5.30, Morley phoned Dave in a panic. Floyd, the janitor, couldn't get the PA working. No, no one will hear the narrator, said Morley. Help! Now, as a young man, Dave spent, what, 20 years on the road with so many rock and roll tours, he had forgotten half the places he'd been to. If anyone could rustle up a working sound system in a hurry, it was Dave. No problem, he said. I'll look after it. I love you, said Morley. <laughs> and she hung up. The doors to the auditorium were, were scheduled to open at 7. By 6.30, the room was already half full and beginning to heat up. A half an hour later, it was full and families were still streaming in. There's something about sitting on a plastic chair, several sizes too small for you, that, that puts you in touch with feelings you didn't know you had. <laughs> Especially if you come to this chair on a cold December night in a winter coat, and there's no place for you to put your coat except in your lap. You sit in your tiny seat and you have thoughts that you'll never share with anyone. <laughs> N not even your mate. Because the things you're thinking of are so depraved, <laughs> you couldn't share them with anyone. Not, not even a therapist. <laughs> Especially a therapist. On Thursday night at 6.45, Pete Eckersall was sitting on one of the chairs at the back of the hall thinking awful thoughts. He hadn't eaten all day. He was feeling dizzy, sitting as he was in his tiny seat, his knees up around his ears, his parka open, his tie undone, his hat pushed back on his head, 
staring dolefully at the Rice Krispie Square he had bought for dinner. It was Pete Eckersall's 16th straight Christmas pageant. Pete has a daughter in university, a son in grade five, and most depressingly, a third child. Another daughter who's three years old. Pete, Pete was sitting in the chair doing the addition in his mind. There'd be eight more nights like this one in his life, he thought glumly. At a quarter past eight, 15 minutes after the concert should have begun, Dave still hadn't arrived with the sound system. Morley decided to start without him. As long as he got there before the narrators climbed into the scaffolding at the beginning of Act Two, everything would be fine. On Morley's command, the auditorium lights dimmed and the curtains rose. And there, on the stage, was a pine tree standing all alone. And a murmur which began in the front row swept through the room when the pine tree took two steps forward. And row by row, people recognized it as none other than the school principal, Nancy Cassidy. Nancy, smiling, bowing awkwardly, welcome, she said, to our annual pageant. And then she gasped as a papier-mâché moon dropped abruptly from the sky and <laughs> swung across the stage in front of her like a, like a scythe. Sorry, said a tiny voice from the wings as the <laughs> moon rose jerkily out of sight. <laughs> the grade ones opened the show, parents craning their necks as the kids marched earnestly down the aisles, swinging their arms, singing. When they arrived on the stage, everything ground to a halt momentarily when Eli Razminsky, who had the opening line, stood on the stage staring at his shoes, frozen in place until the gym teacher scooped out of the wings and held him up and said the lines for him. <laughs> All things considered, the rest of the half went smoothly. There were the awkward but unexpected missed cues, the children who waved incessantly at the audience, <laughs> parents who snuck out as soon as their child had performed. Parents holding crying babies who wouldn't leave. A Christmas tree that fell on stage. But from her vantage point backstage, Morley was feeling, if not victorious, at least grateful when they arrived at the end of Act One without a major disaster. As the intermission began, someone passed her a message from Dave. He was on his way with the sound system. As she faced the beginning of Act Two, Morley was feeling pretty good about things. The kindergartens, who everyone thought were too young to include in the play, were set up to open the second half with, with a single song. And as soon as they had finally organized themselves into rows, you could see that Gretchen Scheuler was going to cry. Gretchen's candle had gone out. Her head was hanging down. And sure enough, when the piano began and everyone started to sing, Gretchen's shoulders started to shake. When no one came to her rescue, Gretchen really let loose. Her hands covering her eyes, her shoulders shuddering, her sobs audible even over the singing. It was while everyone's eyes were on Gretchen that the stage door opened, sending a blast of cold air through the auditorium. And as the cold air hit them one by one, the kindergarten kids stopped singing and they turned to stare at the apparition outlined in the door. A huge man with a ponytail wearing a black t-shirt with the sleeves cut out and motorcycle boots. He was six foot four if he was a foot. He had a studded belt and ham hock arms and a tattoo of a large bird on his shoulder and a scruffy beard. He looked like a biker. Gretchen Scheuler was the last to spot him, and because he was the first adult within reach since her candle had gone out, she did the only thing she could think of doing. She ran across the stage and wrapped her arms around his leg. <laughs> and he limped across the stage with Gretchen clinging to his leg like a brace. And he said, where do you want the speakers? 
And two other guys appeared through the door behind him, one unrolling a thick black coaxial cable and the other lugging a speaker the size of a Volkswagen. <laughs> Dave was the last through the door. He was carrying a large control board. What are you doing, said Morley, when she pushed her way through the kindergartens and up to her husband. The best I can, said Dave. <laughs> they were not doing much better in the double science lab, or the holding tank, as Morley had begun to call it. <laughs> there were too many kids crammed into too small a place for even the best of circumstances, and this was not the best of circumstances. <laughs> the kids were so revved up that the energy level in the lab was beyond belief. It was a deadly combination of butterflies and boredom, of nervousness and nerve. The parent volunteers who had been placed in charge of the room had no experience with this many children in one place at one time. They didn't understand that if you didn't nip the first eruption in the bud, that the room could go completely berserk. <laughs> the kids sensed their distraction. In one corner, a group of grade sixes were circled around the infamous Mark Portner, watching with academic interest as he tried to feed his Ritalin to a boy in grade four. <laughs> On the other side of the room, three younger boys were trying to stuff Simon Newbridge into a locker, <laughs> which is when the door opened and Morley hit them with a blast of sound that shut everyone up. Street scene, said Morley. We need the grade threes. We're starting. Five minutes later, everyone was on stage. Morley was standing at the back of the auditorium holding Dave's hand. They were waiting for the narrators to scramble up the scaffolding so they could begin act two. Someone had lifted Gretchen Scheuler up onto the scaffolding with them, and she was sitting on the edge of the platform, her feet swinging back and forth, clutching the candle that someone had finally lit. <laughs> Morley smiled at Dave as Mike Carroll stepped up to the microphone. Dave winked, and he reached down and flicked the PA on, and then Mike, who was about to say his opening lines, paused and frowned and looked around the room. There, there was a hum, an electronic hum that had begun when Dave flicked on the PA, a hum that began like the hum of a distant train but was growing louder <laughs> and louder, and people were looking around and you couldn't tell where it was coming from because now it sounded like it was coming from everywhere, like it was the hum of God himself like the hum of creation, like the hum at the end of the world. And the kids in the audience stopped moving and babies in the front row stopped crying because it was a hum you felt now as much as you heard. And it felt like the hum was going to swallow the room. And not knowing what to do, Mike Carroll leant into the microphone and, and spoke his first line into the hum, his first line which was, Winter loomed. Winter loomed except it didn't sound at all like Mike Carroll in grade six saying winter loomed. <laughs> Instead, it sounded like the voice of God himself. <laughs> and when he spoke this line, winter loomed, it sounded more like God had said, you are doomed. <laughs> And when he said it, Mark jumped back from the microphone, <laughs> surprised at the sound of himself, and then there was a, a smell of smoke. <laughs> and Mark looked helplessly around for Morley, but before he found her, there was a large bang from each of the large speakers <laughs> on either side of the stage, and then sparks. <laughs> Not Roman candles, just cone-shaped eruptions of electricity and shrieks from the kindergarten kids who had moved into the front row and were sitting on the floor in front of the speakers, and wild applause from the boys in grade six. <laughs> and there was a moment of pure, dead, dark silence. 
Dave was staring at Gretchen Scheuler, who was at the top of the scaffold, holding her lit candle over her head as if it were an Olympic torch, the flame only inches from the brass nozzle of the school's sprinkler system. <laughs> the heat from Gretchen's candle melted the safety nozzle and the water pressure in the sprinkler system blew and the fire alarm began to ring and in the wink of an eye everyone was drenched their hair plastered down by the force of the water as nozzle after nozzle popped open everyone ducking down their hands over their heads as they fought their way out of the auditorium doors it was like a British soccer riot. <laughs> Nancy Cassidy, who had changed back into her pine tree costume for the closing number, was knocked over in the rush for the doors. <laughs> when the school emptied, she was left in a stairwell spinning on her back like a beetle, <laughs> unable to get herself up. When the fireman found her, Arthur the dog was standing over her in his sheep costume, licking her face. <laughs> the fireman helped her up and out of her costume, her carefully curled hair hanging limply over her forehead, her mascara streaking down her cheeks. The dog was trying to kill me, was all she could say. <laughs> There were only two people left in the auditorium, Dave and Pete Eckersall, the survivor of 16 Christmas pageants. <laughs> Pete, who was still sitting in his chair when the fireman turned the sprinklers off, stood up, looked around, nodded at Dave and said, nice concert. I think I'll be heading home now. <laughs> School was closed on Friday, though the word is they're pretty sure they'll have things back in shape for Monday morning. <laughs> Morley only knows this secondhand. She was too mortified to go anywhere near anyone for the rest of that week. On Friday night, however, she went to the mall with Sam, and they ran into the troublesome Mark Portner. He was kneeling in front of a pop machine by the supermarket doors, his arms stuffed into the machine all the way up to the elbow. <laughs> Morley watched him pull a can of Dr. Pepper out before he spotted her. Hello, miss, he said earnestly, slipping the pop smoothly out of sight. That was an awesome concert. I'll never forget it. He, he seemed to mean it. Mor Morley smiled and turned to go, but Mark wasn't finished with her. He followed her a few steps. Are you going to do it again next year, miss? <laughs> Mor Morley smiled. I don't know, she said. I, I was wondering, said Mark, if, if you do, I was wondering, could I run the sprinklers? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.